Hello everyone and uh, welcome to our live panel discussion and thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm really excited to be joined today uh, by John Bailey, who is Professor of Ethnomusicology at the head of, and head of the Afghanistan Music Unit at Goldsmith. Um, and he's researched music in Afghanistan and the diaspora for over 30 years. Uh, I'm also joined by Ziba Tabrizi, who is a leading excellent of dance from Afghanistan, Iran, Azerbaijan and other neighbouring regions and is Britain's only professional Afghan dance soloist. Um, I'm also joined by Lauren Braithwaite, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Oxford, where she's researching the position of music in Afghanistan since 2001. And she's also a conductor of the Zora Orchestra, Afghanistan's first all-woman orchestra. And uh, we are also finally joined by Zarifa Adiba, who uh, enrolled as a student in the Afghanistan National Institute, uh, Institute of Music at 15 years old, taking up the violin, violin and viola and has now become one of the first Afghan woman conductors ever in her role with the Zora Orchestra. Um, Zarifa is now studying politics uh, in Bishkek at the American University of Central Asia. So uh, to uh, take off with today's discussion, um, if we start off with Ziba. Um, Ziba, could you tell us a little bit about your journey into becoming a professional dancer? Well, um, I've been dancing all my life. Uh, my mother took me to ballet lessons when I was about three, except it wasn't really ballet. It was more, today girls will pretend to be trees. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, I studied that for a while and then kind of left dance for a bit, but it was something I'd al always enjoyed and always felt a kind of instinctive affinity for, which I think I think so, I think some people have, you know. Um, and then I discovered, um, I discovered Iranian dance, actually, when I was a student. Um, I became very interested in that, pursued that initially. And then um, gradually diversified, and I picked up various other dance styles from that region of Central Asia, Middle East, Southern Asia, and came eventually to Afghan dance, which um, has been an, an absolute eye opener in terms of how exciting it is and how many things there are to discover all the time. So it's been it's been yeah. a very interesting. I've been working professionally for about ten years, and it's been a very very a really interesting time. Actually, really really um, yeah, absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So what was it that you found so compelling about Afghan dance in particular? What drew you to uh, become a specialist? Well, I'm afraid I'm not going to give a very intellectual answer here. It's just <laughs> really cool. The costumes are absolutely beautiful. The music, I would defy anybody to not hear uh, to hear Afghan mass music and not be just feel really excited by it. It's the rhythm. Yeah. It's the kind of vocal style that the that the musicians have. It, it's just it's just it's just great. It's it's not like anything else either. It's really really unusual. I realised that for me, selfishly speaking, there was there was a performance niche. Uh, that, that there weren't a lot of performers of Afghan dance at all, and that was something that I could do. Um, and I, I I absolutely love it. Yeah, it's it, it's different. It's colourful. It's exciting. It's dynamic. It's just really cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what are the, some of the characteristics that you think are the most distinctive? Uh, for instance, like, um, why do you think the clothing, particularly in what you're wearing today, I don't think we can't uh, mention the dress. Um, why is clothing so central to Afghan dance? Well, I think clothing, clothing is essential. I mean, in Afghanistan, it's a, a very multi-ethnic country and each ethnic group has its own, its own, its own traditional dress. Um, but that, I mean, all the dresses are ideal for dancing because of the shape. So they, they're tied in at a high waist, kind of a, a Jane Austen empire line, but far more exciting than that. They then flare out like a bell and they are perfect for dance, pretty much any kind of dance, really. They're these really wide, dramatic sleeves, they're, they're high, heavily embroidered, encrusted in mirrors and embroidery and beads and little, little bells. And they're, they're, they're perfect. They really enhance the movement that the mirrors on some of the costumes, particularly the ones which come originally from, um, from a Pashto background, but which I use in dance because simply because they're very eye catching. They're studded with really, really heavy mirror work, and that gives the cloth a lot of flow. It really makes the, 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 the costumes flow beautifully. Um, and the way they catch the light is fantastic. You're, you're, you're a disco ball, a walking disco ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you truly are this evening. Um, <laughs> moving to um, Lauren and Zarifa, um, the Zora Orchestra is Afghanistan's first all-woman orchestra. Lauren, could you tell us a little bit about the story as to how you came to be involved, but also how the orchestra came to came to life? So the orchestra began before my time in, in Afghanistan. It started in 2015 when a young trumpet 
player named Mina um, approached the director of the Afghanistan National Institute of Music and said, why can't we have an ensemble just for girls? And of course, Dr. Samas did not have an answer otherwise than why not? So <laughs> it started off very much as, as, a, as a chamber group, just a group of, of female students coming together each, each lunchtime to, to play Afghan songs. And the teacher at the time, who I eventually um, took over from, she arranged Afghan songs, also Western classical songs for the, the, the ensemble, the instrumentation they had um, in the ensemble. And of course it was like a snowball, more, more girls wanted to, to join in. Of and course, yeah. Zarifa can tell, me, tell us how she got involved. And eventually a whole, an entire orchestra was, was put together. And then word got out about the orchestra um, being in Afghanistan. And that's when uh, the World Economic Forum approached Dr. Samas and said, we would like to bring the orchestra over. And, and from there, the international fame came. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I had the, um, great pleasure of, of joining the institute in 2016 so the orchestra was about a year old at that point i had i was doing my master's degree and wanted to look at a music project uh, somewhere where music wasn't easy to to come by or it, not easy to come by but easy to to pursue um, and look at the challenges that the educational institutions face in in such circumstances and mm -hmm. I went out there for two weeks to do my my research and while I was there um was asked if, if I'd be interested in applying for for a position as woodwind teacher and six months later I was out in Kabul and I joined the orchestra initially as a flute player because there wasn't a female flautist at the school at the time um and then eventually uh, that my the predecessor who was also conducting the orchestra, uh, he, he moved on, went back to the States and I just put them on kind of leadership and artistic direction of the of the ensemble um, and, and did that for three years and, and it was a fantastic experience. I can imagine, yeah. Um, and Zarifa is a former student and now a teacher and conductor. Can you tell us about your journey into sorry? Uh, can you tell us about your journey into how you joined the orchestra? Uh, so I grew up in Pakistan as a refugee and then I moved to Afghanistan in 2014. Uh, that was the time that I wanted to become a pop star, a pop singer. I had no clue about music. I had no clue about Afghanistan National Institute of Music. I had no clue about like uh, uh, like the instruments and everything. Then when I joined, uh, when I went to Afghanistan in 2014, uh, I wanted to search for a vocal coach. And uh, during this uh, time, I found out about the music school. And it took me like for two weeks or three weeks to get an appointment with Dr. Samas. Then uh, uh, the process was a bit long, but I got into Afghanistan National Institute of Music in like in three months almost. Then uh, I started playing viola. Uh, I, as I said, I had no clue about music, how it is, how it was, but uh, like I came into music world suddenly and uh, music introduced me that everything that I'm doing right now. So I started viola and then in 2016, end of 2016, when I, kept, when I went back from a summer program from Yale University, uh, Dr. Sermas asked me to um, conduct the orchestra at the World Economic Forum. I had no clue. I was like shocked at first and then I was excited. And then I was like, I think I can say just excitement about it. And uh, then um, I conducted the orchestra at the World Economic Forum. And now I'm at the American University of Central Asia studying international politics. Maybe we will talk about that later, but why I'm here today. Yeah, wow. Well, what an amazing triumph to uh, have taken on the position as a conductor after learning. Um, and John, you yourself have been involved in um, several music education initiatives, but could you tell us a little bit about your experiences conducting research in Afghanistan in ethnomusicology? Uh, with over 30 years of experience, I'm sure you've got plenty to tell us. Too much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> well, 
Well, I first went to Afghanistan in 1965, driving through on my way to Australia. And as yeah. uh, Lise Doucette likes to say, she says, I always say no one goes to Afghanistan once. Once you <laughs> go, you always go back. I went back again in 1970, and then I changed my career from experimental psychology to uh, ethnomusicology, and I needed to, a fieldwork site, and because of my interest in the music of Afghanistan, that was an obvious place to go. So I then spent two years living in the city of Herat with my wife, Veronica, working on the whole range of musical activities there. And that, that period just spanned the, uh, the uh, Dawood Khan period. Uh, a year mm -hmm. after we left to go back to the UK, then there was the, um, the communist revolution and the war and all of that. So my work after that point was very much to do with uh, music in the, um, in the uh, diaspora. So I've yeah. worked with Afghan musicians in Pakistan, uh, Iran, Germany, uh, California, Australia, and of course, London. So that's kind of the two halves of my work. But playing yeah. the music has always been very important for me. Yeah. And what have you found to be uh, some of the experiences, the musicians that you've been working with over the years and the diaspora groups? Um, you know, how have they struggled to kind of keep up uh, with their playing and their, and their involvement with uh, Afghan music? Well, it's uh, difficult to answer that question because it's such a varied kind of experience. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, one of the difficulties faced by migrants is the, is the problem of getting instruments. You know, it's very hard to get instruments like the Rabab, Jotar, whatever, if you're not actually in Afghanistan itself. I know it still continues to this day because my students are saying, well, where can I get a Rabab from? And, you know, mm -hmm. there's no easy answer to that question. You can't get a good Rabab yeah. in London. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and what's been your experience uh, with your research of the sort of new musical life since 2001 in terms of the kind of post-Taliban uh, regime and the kind of rebirth of music? What's been your um, kind of perception of that and your experience? Well, I'll, I'll read you something a bit later on that particular thing, but I wanted to read you something about um, uh, something that really appealed to me about, uh, uh, we've gone down again. Oh, there we are. Um, this is this is from my teacher. It's an okay. account of uh, a memorable dawn in the spring in a garden in the city uh, near Herat. Can I read it? Of course, yes, please. Yeah. Okay. He says, we were sitting and playing really well, really good music and singing. At about two in the morning, they started to get sleepy. The nights were short. Two hours later, it would be dawn. In springtime, it gets light that early. I didn't feel sleepy. I quietly took my rhubarb and went to sit by a big tub with flowers growing in it. I took a carpet with me and sat down there quietly. I was waiting for the first glow of dawn. Very gently, I took up my rhubarb and started to get it in tune. That gave me exquisite pleasure. I tuned it to Asa, Mand Asa. I kept on tuning it until every string was completely to my satisfaction. And then I reached for my plectrum. I played the introduction, the shackle. I, as I played, I saw the first rays of light. I heard the nightingales and other birds singing from every direction. And from every direction, the perfumes of morning came to me. It made me feel wonderfully refreshed to smell those flowers. But the others were all asleep, snoring. What's this? Get up, I cried. That's not pleasure. This is pleasure. They were sprawled all over the place. Some had eaten too much and their eyes were all puffed up. Get up. Nothing, said to the world. Get up. One of them groaned. I took my rhubarb again and played some more and saw them begin to awaken and to listen from where they lay. God bless you, one said, because when you're asleep and woken by the sound of music, it gives great pleasure. One by one, they got up and came to sit with me. May God shame you. Is this the time for sleep? I said, come, look, this is pleasure. This is enjoyment. Taste this. And they were saying, yes, by God. 
Observe, I said, the breeze, now it's light, the songbirds, the green, the scent of flowers. Wah, wah. And you want to sleep? What's going on? Yes, they said. By God, you have and transported us with delight. So I give that as a very kind of poetic vision of, you know, my teacher was the, 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 the best teacher in Herat, the best musician. But it, this really conveys the uh, Herati, the Afghan uh, love of nature and of um, the pleasure of music. Even the act of getting the rabob in tune is itself a highly satisfying aesthetic experience. Mm, I can imagine that was really beautiful. So thank you for reading that to us. Um, Lauren, you also conduct um, some research while doing your PhD. You've been uh, researching uh, Afghan music in a similar way, but I'm sure you have some of your own stories. Um, could you tell us a bit more about what your research is examining and um, the kind of things you've uncovered about um, music and its role in uniting people and and in peace processes and etc. So at the moment it's a it's very exploratory. Um, I haven't um, definitely found any any key things. In fact, I've found so many different themes. Um, it's got to be all all sorted out. But the the thing I'm looking at is is what is the place of music education in in society, especially since 2001. What what role does it play in Afghan society, and how accepted is is music education by Afghan society in general? And I'm finding a sort of a dichotomy, a, a, a very uneasy binary in, in in many aspects of Afghan life. Um, music is, is is celebrated and people listen to music all the time but a lot of musicians who are studying in in music institutes are receiving negative feedback for 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 uh, for pursuing music as a career and I want mm -hmm. to understand what are the what are the contemporary uh, reasons for this 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 sort of dichotomy between accepting music as part of everyday life but also saying no you shouldn't you shouldn't really be pursuing a, a career as a musician um but on the contrary music education seems to be playing a huge role in um, the development of um human human rights uh the role it's playing in, in developing women's rights their freedoms in everyday life giving them a voice um to speak up about Different things in their in their in their life, the, the issues that they're facing. Um, music is is giving people an more of an open world as to what 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 possibilities they've got for their future. Um, and it's all it's not specifically just music. It's just the the, the what music can afford people. Um, the team building, the sense of empowerment, um, their just their general um, development as, as citizens. Um, so that's that's really what I'm what I'm exploring at the moment um, through, through my that's research. Cool. Yeah, that sounds really really fascinating. Um, and kind of coming off that point, um, Zarifa, obviously through that, what's your experience been in terms of why it's important for young women to have the opportunity to be part of initiatives like the orchestra? I mean, um, why is it so important to involve women in, in music and dance? cultures in terms of peace building and, and uniting people? What have been your experiences? Uh, my experience, uh, like personally, uh, I think that since I started uh, being a member of the youth orchestra, playing viola beside boys and other girls uh, who were from different parts of uh, my country, like from different ethnicity, we all were coming together. First, that we were showing a very beautiful image of youth, the new generation coming. Uh, second, we were showing that music, like how diverse, how diversity it can bring among the new generation, how it can unite everyone. Because uh, we all are, we all know about the history. We all know that this ethnicity problem has been in Afghanistan for so long now. But our orchestra, we all were coming from different backgrounds, but we all were playing together. We were making beautiful music. So I think that was one one of the one of the one of the things that I learned that music can build in my country, which can give a message to the youth. The second one was that it was really giving um, me the courage to dream bigger, 
the courage to believe that I'm no less than uh, any other person in my country and giving me the courage to uh, to dream the same thing for other girls who are not able to go to school even. So personally, music and orchestra and Afghanistan National Institute of Music has influenced me in so many ways. And these are some. That's amazing, yeah. And, and from that point, John, um, what's been your experience listening to what Zarif is saying here in terms of it uniting lots of people and uh, from different backgrounds and experiences and ethnicities? What would you say the experience has been um, in some of the diaspora groups you've, you've worked with, with the musicians? Is it, is it something that um, brings diaspora communities together? How is it uh, manifested? Uh, well, it certainly brings uh, uh, people together when there's a big concert in London, especially if it's uh, one of the big stars over from California or wherever. <laughs> then uh, that's really uh, packed out and people are really you know, enjoying this modern kind of music but I'm not so concerned with with uh, that aspect of things as the the survival really of the more traditional types of music that's because of um, after the Taliban I went back to Kabul for the first time for 17 years and uh, to see what the state of music was at that time and it uh, it struck me very uh, uh, quickly how many musical instruments there were now available. The, the music shops were packed full of harmoniums and tablas and so on. They'd all been imported from Pakistan very quickly. Um, but uh, this kind of music that I recognized as being really in danger was the more art music end, the Afghan classical music, the, the classical music of Kabul that grew up very much in the, the courts of the Amirs from the, the later part of the 19th century. From my point of view, that music is a really precious pearl that needs to be nurtured and uh, developed and supported. And uh, from my visit there, I was in touch then with the Aga Khan um, initiative, and they were very keen that I should start a small uh, music course in Kabul to teach, to, to find four teachers for this kind of traditional music and that is what I did and it was very difficult to manage that from London and so I gave up after two years and then uh, somebody else took over Mirwais Sidiqi became the director of the Aga Khan school in Kabul mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he, he was doing that for 10 years and he really allowed that school to develop tremendously and also to develop uh, connections with the music department of Kabul University. That's another aspect of things that uh, we don't hear very, very much about. So yeah. he's, he continues his role there, but he, he goes uh, to Kabul for three months at a time, and then he's back in London where his family is, and then he's back in Kabul and so on. So that's an ongoing project. Yeah. So another example of a fantastic education project, kind of making sure that um, music and dance culture kind of prevails and um, coming off that. I, uh, um, I just uh, want it, to make one point. Oh yeah, of course. I may. Well, uh, it, it, it's clear that um, you know my own work in in Afghanistan has almost exclusively been with male musicians. The wife, my my wife Veronica's work has been with the women's side. Of things, so together we have managed to put these uh, these together. And the, the fact is that actually it depends what you mean by music. But the, the the largest number of individuals who perform music in Afghanistan are women, because women yeah. uh, music is part of women's life. It's part of the women's domestic scene. So most women are able to sing and perform to play the frame drum the daira and at wedding celebrations and so on within the families and all the endless engagement parties, then they are they are required to perform. So they have that um, latent musicality there. And it's wonderful that schools like Anim and the Aga Khan School has some women uh, students and also the university is enabling women in Afghanistan to obtain uh, musical training and to be and recognize recognition as 
performance. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Yeah. Well <laughs> um, and Zeba, um, coming off our earlier point about kind of the experience of diaspora groups, mm. uh, what has been your experience in terms of uh, dance performance and its its role in creating a sense of unity and, and closeness to, you know, a national identity for the diaspora groups that you often mm. or, or work work alongside? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really it seems to be really, really important for people. It's dance is a it's it's central to most of the social events that I attend, um, irrespective of what kind of event it is, I appear at all kinds of things, weddings, engagement parties, um, human rights events, refugee events. I do a lot of work with charities. Um, yeah, so all, all kinds of all people from all walks of life really love it. They really identify and they want it kind of as a, a focal point of their of their celebration. And people tell me, you know, it's like it's like a taste of home. It reminds me of where I come from. People People come over quite nostalgic, actually. And I've had people say, people say really nice things. Oh, you've made my new year by coming to this party and doing this performance. And yeah, it's just, it, 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 it's essential, I think, to people's identity, definitely. And it's something that, rather like music, it, it unites the diaspora, no matter how far away people are from their original homeland, particularly with the technology that we have now, um, music and access to, access to music through online sources, access to dance, also through online sources, videos, etc. Um, you know, it's it, it's available to to everybody now, which is great. Um, and it kind of it all makes it makes the diaspora a bit more united, a bit more a bit more compact, really. I think. Yeah. No, of course. And so, do you think there there could be scope for sort of similar initiatives to the things we've heard about now, in terms of um, for dance initiatives within within the UK for diaspora groups? Where do you think there's scope for that? Uh, well, actually, I was thinking uh, this is something I actually feel very strongly about. I think there's tremendous commercial potential for Afghan. I'm, I'm talking here about about a more popular forms of Afghan music and dance. I work main. I work with some traditional musicians. I also work with pop music uh, with with musicians that that play pop music, and I think there's tremendous potential there. Um, and we live in a country, Britain's a, a multicultural, multi-ethnic country where there are all kinds of celebrations which derive from different cultural backgrounds. We have carnivals, we have Asian mellas, we have flag and boat racing, all kinds of things, which are very often led by people who come from those cultural backgrounds. But they're very, very widely and enthusiastically attended by people from all sorts of all sorts of origins, all sorts of, uh, of, of, of ethnicities and cultures. And I think we should do the same for Afghan dance. As I said earlier, you know, you, you, you can't, I don't think anyone could deny how colourful it is, how powerful the music is, how dynamic it is. Um, and I, I really, really want to see it more in the mainstream. It needs so much more mainstream exposure than it, than it has. If there's anyone watching who's interested in helping me to bring Afghan dance to the mainstream, I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> and I work too, if I might add, this is kind of based on um, what you asked me about my journey into dance. In my excitement, I forgot a really, a really exciting anecdote. Um, I spent some years working mainly in the Iranian community, and I still do. I still, um, I'm still, I still attend a lot of, uh, a lot of Iranian cultural events. But um, for example, at that time, this was about 10 years ago, um, a charity called Magic of Persia, an Iranian charity, used to have a really big Noruz event at the British Museum. It was huge. And that was actually where I, have my, where I had my big break. So this ties in with um, mainstream appeal of a culture and sort of presenting a culture in the mainstream where lots and lots of different people of different backgrounds can enjoy it. And also a story of self-belief because I've done very few high profile events, really no high profile events actually. And I heard about this huge Nauru's weekend and I thought, oh, I wonder if I could be in it. And I emailed the organizer, I said, can I be in your event? No reply for a while. I thought, oh, I just forgot about it. And then she replied and said, yes, we'll give you eight shows over two days. Oh, excellent. So I bet I prepped so hard. I learned so many different dances. 40,000 people came and that was my big break. 40,000, and after that, the phone didn't stop ringing. I kept on having inquiries, can you come to this event and this event? So that's a story yeah. on the one hand of, of self-belief for our viewers. I strongly believe if you believe in yourself and you put yourself forward for an opportunity, the chances are that the person on the other end will feed off your self-belief and they will, they, they, they will want what you offer. So that's one thing. And also it would be amazing if there could be an Afghan event like that in, in London, anywhere, 
40,000 people came through the doors of the British Museum. That would just be phenomenal. And, you know, I, I actually, I go into schools and colleges, I work in education, and I go into schools and colleges and I give outreach talks to do with Afghan culture and cultures from related from neighboring regions. And they're mainly to white British school children, boys and girls. And afterwards, they're really interested. Their teachers tell me that they went off and looked up Atan on YouTube, or they went off and looked up various Afghan pop stars to listen to their music. The interest is definitely there to be tapped. And it would be fantastic if Afghanistan, Afghan culture on all levels could enjoy real, real mainstream exposure to people of, of all different backgrounds so that they can enjoy it. Yeah, well, I think, as you say, it shows that there's such a space that could be tapped into there. Definitely, yeah. Celebrate different aspects of it, which mm. I guess, you know, the, I mean, Lauren and, and Zarifa, you had the experience in, in you know, at the um, when you went to Davos in terms of at the World Economic Forum. No, sorry, we went to Swiss, Switzerland, was it? Well, that's, yeah. 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 Um, uh, and I mean, the, the kind of like platform that must have given you in terms of the international attention, I mean, um, how important was that in terms of raising awareness of, of the orchestra, but also in terms of ensuring its longevity and its kind of um, attention that should be, it deservedly should get? Well, I'll, I'll say something and then pass over to Zarifa, because Zarifa was involved in a lot of panel discussions at the forum, so she'll know about that, that side of things. But I think from a, as an educator being involved in, in, that, in that tour, it, it meant that we weren't just being um, heard about within a very small um, community of, of, of musicians who, who maybe work in education or who, who have an affiliation with, with Afghanistan. It meant that we were literally on a global, a global uh, platform. And so we were being um, shared on YouTube, shared on social media, and then of course other organisations and uh, arts and, and concert organisers would see the video and think, wow, this is a really exciting project, look at these fantastic women, they've got a message of, of, um, of women's rights and, and, and showcasing, like John said earlier, showcasing women musicians and performers from Afghanistan. We want to bring them to, to our, our festival or our conference. And so that then led on to further tours in the in the coming years, and it wasn't just the notoriety of um, the notoriety, but the, the 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 fame of the orchestra and getting um, the orchestra's message around the world. But it, it also meant there was just far more educational opportunities for these for these girls, and mm -hmm. so more conducting experience for the for the two conductors, more performance time, and opportunities for these for these girls to practice. And, and know that they're going to have a enthusiastic audience to, to perform to, because in, in Kabul there are very few, if not any, performance opportunities. Um, yeah. And so it's very hard to keep the enthusiasm to practice and practice when you think, well, there's no one to share the music with. Mm -hmm. And so having, having um, that, that kind of springboard to then go on further international tours meant that the girls were really enthusiastic really motivated to practice we were um arranging harder and harder music and as players as musicians they were just improving exponentially um as the months went went along um Zarifa might be able to tell you a bit more about how she felt the uh the, the Davos tour went to yeah. uh would you mind Kat uh, repeating your question please yeah, um, so kind of how important was the World Econom Economic Forum for you in terms of creating a space for the orchestra and, and giving it the due attention that it deserved? Like how how much um, was that kind of a vital role for you guys um, in terms of you as students, but also the kind of um, ability for the orchestra to carry on and, and be noticed? Uh, once my one of my teacher Jennifer Moberg told me like I was ninth grade I think she said that being the first and being the best are the same so now when I'm realizing that when I'm remembering that I like I I get to know that being the first and being the best with both of these how they are related maybe we girls we started our journey like um, we started our journey not so long uh, and we suddenly went to Davos and we played 
because we were the first female orchestra, we were, everybody knows that how the situation in Afghanistan is. A lot of girls, when we were back from Davos uh, to Afghanistan, some of the girls went to their villages and they never come back to school. A uh, few of our girls got married suddenly. I was stopped from going to school, you know? So these all problems were facing each member of Zohra Orchestra, but we were the first female uh, musicians, or, or we, we, we created the first female orchestra in our country and we went, in the like in a world like which was like a world stage you know world economic forum like almost the world was listening to us looking at us and and watching us we were playing music but the message was not just uh, the diversity of music that we were playing western music and afghan music or we were play or we were presenting afghan music with afghan instruments and western uh, instruments you know but the message was broader than that because we were going from a country that most of the countries in the world are thinking that there are taliban or blast or violence against women or you know all these horrible news that people watch on social media we were mm -hmm. wearing our beautiful again traditional dresses we were having our instruments and we were playing for the world there you know Maybe like we were not the best musicians. Uh, here is uh, Mr. John Billy, and he may know that we were like the music was not perfect, but we were the first, and we tried the best to show uh, at least a tiny bit of the beauty that exists in my country. You know. Beside that, when we come to girls' power, there when I was sitting in the panel beside Dr. Sarmas, the founder and director of Afghanistan National Institute of Music, and there were like tons of cameras in front of me, a lot of journalists, and they were asking questions that, how do you feel as a girl sitting up there? Or uh, how do you feel as a girl conducting? And I was like, I was just thinking that right now I'm like, still I'm thinking that I was dreaming. And on that time, when I was there, I was thinking that I'm dreaming. But one thing that came in my mind was that, okay, I'm here to speak from all those girls who are in my country. They are not even allowed to go to school, but I'm playing music, I'm conducting orchestra, you know? So this was some, one a very important thing in my mind to tell the world that, okay, Okay, we are presenting a very beautiful match of Afghanistan, but it's still there are things going on in my country that are still going on in my country and it still needs help, you know? Mm -hmm. So the experience was amazing, great, and uh, yeah, nice. Yeah. I mean, I guess showing how important it is and how, you know, passionate you are for such an incredible thing. Uh, the most important thing at the moment as well is is the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on on the students and, and their ability to continue in this kind of program. Obviously, neither of you are currently in Kabul with, with the orchestra, but um, do you have any idea how the coronavirus is impacting the students and, and um, their education? Because as you say, it's uh, never been more important that it's continued and, and, and furthered. Um, so Lauren, do you have any idea? Yes, well, they're doing a fantastic job over there keeping things going. Um, I have students, I'm in contact with students very regularly and teachers. Um, the main barriers or, or hurdles for, for continuing um, a music education project um, consistently is first taking the instruments home and practicing them. Um, if you take a, a saxophone or a trumpet, to um to a house up in Chandawul or, or a, a area of, of Kabul and your neighbors are not perhaps as enthusiastic about about music then it can be it can be a safety risk um it's it's, it's um it's very challenging uh, some some neighborhoods will be very supportive some families are very supportive and, and would love that to happen but not everybody shares the same same views so some students um are not able to to practically practice at home and mm -hmm. they can't have lessons online with their with their teachers um but some students are in a position where they've got a good internet connection they've got the the, the equipment or technology to be able to connect with their teachers and 
I think about at the moment, 30% of, of the students are able to connect with their students who, with their teachers who are in different places in the world. They've got, they've had to go back, back to their own countries. And there is a pilot scheme um, in place at the moment to, to get tablets and electronic devices to, to the students who don't own them. Um, mm -hmm. Then connect with their, with their with their teachers as well um, for as long as this this situation continues. So um, yeah, lots of things are happening in terms of trying to get the the students online for long distance learning. Yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, thirty percent at least. There's still you know a, a good proportion of them doing it. But as you say, it's good that there's some some schemes in place to try and increase that number because. Uh, as we as we all know, it's uh, difficult for all of us at this time. But um, for people yeah. in Afghanistan, it looks like a slightly longer road than what we have in in the UK. So fingers crossed. Um, and I think what it really shows is that you know we need to continue these initiatives that preserve and, and celebrate and introduce more people to to Afghan music and dance. Um, John, it would be really great if uh, you could kind of talk us through some more of the specifics of um, some Afghan music. We've talked quite broadly, but it would be really, really fantastic if you could tell us a bit more about the rhubarb, um, Afghanistan's national instrument, um, as it such, has such a rich history. Um, if you could tell us a bit about it. My pleasure. It's a bit <laughs> hard to get it in the screen. Something keeps flashing outside. I don't know what it is. Anyway. So this is the rhubarb. It is an extraordinarily sophisticated instrument. It has three sets of strings. It has these three main melody strings. It has these three long drones. And then with these pegs all along here, you have the sympathetic strings, which are tuned to the scale, the mode, the rag, the maham that you're playing in. If I'm in tune, not too bad. This is the mode that Amir John was talking about. Asa, I'll just play a little bit of of this for you. Please do. I don't usually sit in a chair either. This instrument can be played sitting on the floor. Yeah. You hear the reverb? That's the sympathetic strings. just say that these pieces like that I'm playing now were originally dance pieces as performed in the court of Kabul in the late 19th century but we have a whole collection of these pieces Thank you. 
Thank you, John. Well done. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, Zeba, uh, coming off the uh, learning about the rabab, um, would you be able to tell us a little bit about uh, the Atan, the national dance of Afghanistan? Ah, the Atan. Well, this is a very ancient dance, and it's probably a, a, one of the best known elements of Afghan performing art um, and culture, I think. Um, it originated in the Pashtun regions, but actually nowadays people of different ethnic backgrounds may, may perform it. Um, and it's been associated over the years with both war and celebrations. Nowadays, it's a dance that you might find at a party, at um, any kind of celebration, really. Um, it's often performed outdoors. It may have 50 to 100 people, and it can go on for a very long time. I've heard of Atans that last for a couple of hours. And there's a lead dancer, and the participants form a circle. And the lead dancer is the, the, technically the, the most skilled dancer, usually, and then the, the others sort of follow. Um, and the, the, the dance is accompanied by the, by the doll, um, and the players, the doll player and any other musicians, sometimes go in the centre of the circle as well. Um, and the dance is quite... It's not especially complex. It depends on numerous different regional variations. There's not just one kind of atan, um, but it might um, comprise a sequence of forward steps, half turns, full turns. Some have sequences of claps. Some have hankies that people wave in the air as well. It depends really which sort of atan you're interpreting. But the main thing about it is it's a real test of survival of the fittest. Okay, it's a natural selection. Only the fittest dancers will still be left at the end. It gets faster and faster and in some versions of the dance which you know a couple of hours might pass and there's hardly anyone left and only turns are involved and it gets more and more exact um, and then eventually everybody's done for but uh, it's a really exciting dance to watch actually um i've seen many atans performed um very often because it, it's it, it's it's fairly it's fairly taxing you get somebody facing in the wrong direction or putting the wrong arm in at the same at one time while everyone's putting the other arm in but no it's, it's quite a spectacle to watch it's performed in traditional clothing i've seen it performed by groups of men and mixed groups and groups of women as well in uh in events in uh, in the uk so um yeah it's, it's it's pretty it's pretty pretty cool and um i went to an interesting atan anecdote um I went to a women's event in, uh, I think it was in Wembley. Um, there were only women there. Um, the DJ was a man, but he came in, set up his equipment, and then I think he went home and then came back after the event had finished to collect his stuff. And the women, um, when it, they enjoyed my dancing, they said, well, could you could you dance Atan with us? And I didn't really know. I wasn't really familiar with Atan at the time. I said, oh, well, uh, OK. I thought the idea was that I would copy them. And I, I, I just followed what they were doing, went round and round in the circle. And the women eventually got tired and dropped out. And then I realised that I'd kind, I'd somehow become the, I'd somehow become the leader. And they were all the ones that remained were all, were all following me and copying me. So I just kind of made stuff as I went along. And eventually, I was the last person left. And yeah, so that, that, that's, that's how it works. People gradually, gradually fall by the wayside. But it's, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah, really yeah. exciting dance. <laughs> yeah. It's a definitely a very exciting dance to watch, isn't it? It is. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up to the floor for some questions from the audience. We actually have some that were sent over from Instagram um, and Twitter earlier. So I'll start off with those. But um, audience members, if you have any questions, please just post it in the live chat and uh, we'll get to it in a bit. Um, but first up, we have one um, from Instagram earlier uh, for Zarifa, um, which asks, uh, Zarifa is a returning refugee um, from Pakistan. Did music help you feel closer to your identity and, and, and if so, how? When I was a refugee? When, when you returned, um, how, how did it kind of um, foster your, your feeling to feeling closer to your national identity? Uh, so when I returned from Pakistan, how did music? Yeah, yeah. how did it feel? Uh, yeah. So I was living in Pakistan uh, in a city called Quetta. It's a very small uh, city where Afghans live, Afghan refugee lives there. So I was not like I was among Afghans, but in a in a different geography. Then I came back to Afghanistan and it was kind of broader. So before coming to Afghanistan, I just knew my nationality, which is Hazara. 
And uh, the idea that I had about other nationalities was, of course, the idea of my, um, like, olders in the society, you know, because they are still having kind of conflict with other ethnicities, as I mentioned before. So I was thinking about this and I was thinking the same thing, you know. So when I came back to Afghanistan, when I joined Anim, when I joined playing music, I got like my best friends are Pashtun. I have two best friends in my life and both of them are Pashtun. And I have another friend who's very close and who's very near and dear to my heart. He's also Tajik. So I came from a very small uh, society, which was thinking small about just one ethnicity to a broader place, you know? I, I, I got to know that who are Pashtuns, who are Tajiks, who are Uzbeks, and I got to know that we all are the same. There is nothing. The stories that I have been hearing, the stories that I have been told, all are false, nothing, like there's nothing like that. They are the same as me and I'm the same as them, you know? So that that unity, that feeling of accepting everybody in the society, that feeling of uh, accepting everyone as an individual rather than their background and everything. I think music music helped me uh, to, to think bit broader, maybe I can say broader. So music helped me in that way. Amazing. Um, I think we have another one actually for you, Zarifa. Um, how did you feel, how does uh, being part of the orchestra um, empower you to be more ambitious with your future career? So obviously now you're um, at Bishkek and, and studying politics. How, how did the orchestra help you to feel ambitious and, and, and go and study elsewhere? When I was, uh, when I was in orchestra, I never said this story, but... Uh, I was talking to girls. I was uh, one day when we came back from Davos. One day I was uh, walking with my, my one of violinists. Her name was Marjan. We were walking uh, back home. And she was trying her face to, to hide her face somehow. Oh, I don't know why. And then I asked her that, what's up? Why you are hiding your face? Are you afraid? And she said that they, they, the idea that a lot of girls are fearing to study music is uh, uh, like including myself. I was... Uh, uh, studying music, my family didn't know about my journey, just my mom and my stepfather knew until Davos. And then when people got to know I was stopped from going to school, the same, uh, I said that every member of Zohar Orchestra was facing some kind of trouble. Even maybe I can say violence, but we didn't got, get to know, you know? So I got, the orchestra gave me this idea that girls are really struggling to do what they really want. I was struggling to study music because I was a girl. Some of the girls, like, uh, my very close, close friends, they love sports. My sister loves to be an athlete, wants to run, but she cannot because there are beliefs in the society which is not letting her to do, you know? Uh, there are girls who want to study science or there are girls who want to dance, but, they are, but there are beliefs and traditions which are not letting them. And there are girls who are still not allowed to go to school. So this all idea was given by orchestra to me that Zarifa, you can continue your path as a musician and become as famous as you want, earn money for yourself. But there are a lot of other girls who are, you know, that they need your help. So what do you really want to do, you know? And, and then that was a time that I was like, okay, let's think again. And there was a lot of things happening in life, which also made me to think about what profession I really want. But the mus but music and the orchestra and my three years that I had in Anim, uh, I think gave me a complete image of what I really want to do in life. And therefore I chose to study international politics and journalism here because I want to, uh, I, I am not really comfortable to share my big, big dreams, because sometimes people will think, okay, she's dreaming so big and it's not possible. But there are things that 
I can say that I really want every girl in my country to do what really they, what they really want. You know, at least they should be able to study what they really want. Mm -hmm. At least they should be allowed to go to school. Uh, not just for the girls, that people should not think that I'm so anti-feminist or, or not not anti, but feminist. But I'm thinking about every children in my in my country who are going through hardships. You know, so. That, this is the idea that music actually gave me and the orchestra gave me and gave me the courage that my dreams, if I'm able to dream, then I'm able to uh, make them possible. come possible. Yeah. So yeah. I Amazing. Thank you. I mean, it's definitely it's incredible to see that you have such a big dreams for yourself that you won't even share them with us. Uh, I'm glad <laughs> that it's... Uh, <laughs> such a big ambitious dream um coming off that we got we had another question for lauren um looking at um where do you see the scope for future um music education programs in afghanistan sort of how how could it go further and where do you see scope for it to go further well at the moment um a lot of the education institutions are um funded from international um aid and a lot of a lot of questions around what's going to happen when the aid finally dries up or, or, or when there's another crisis and, and people go somewhere else. But actually what I found through my through my research and, and speaking to, to students is that they now have the skills, the knowledge and the equipment to be able to start their own initiatives. So there are little music schools um, popping up all over Kabul now. A guitar school is 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 here, over here, and then there's a as a music band um, school here. And these are grassroots initiatives that aren't relying on on foreign foreign aid or um, foreign teachers coming over. They they the, the foreign teachers have done have done the work. The collaborations happened. Um, the, the master musicians have, have have come back and done done their thing. And now the next generation. Has got the knowledge and the skills to to start their own their own schools, and I think that's that will be where the future of music, um, where, where the future of music education in Afghanistan lies. I think it's in these these graduates who have have um, have come come up through these these institutions through Kabul University, through through Aga Khan, um, Anim, all these places, and they're now starting their own schools because they I was speaking to one one um, student in Herat this morning and he said mm -hmm. I just want to make music education better in my city um, and I will do whatever I can to to do that and he just is like a sponge he he goes on the internet he's looking at books he's speaking to other teachers he just wants wants to um, have everything he, he can possibly have to 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 make music education better yeah I think we can all see that uh through all of this, how vital it is that we, you know, continue to to pursue further education initiatives and and you know bring it bring it to new audiences as well and make sure that we're platforming Afghan culture so that these these kind of people can kind of chase these these dreams and these uh, uh, initiatives that they come up with, especially as it's kind of moving through younger people. Um, I think we are now drawing to the end of the discussion. Um, so thank you everyone so much for joining us today. We hope you've uh, enjoyed enjoyed the discussion and learned something new or been inspired. Uh, maybe start learning the uh, <laughs> rhubarb or get involved at the next uh, <laughs> Afghan evening that you see and, and, and learn to dance the atan. Um, we'd obviously love to say a massive thank you to all four of you for um, being a part of this fantastic discussion and, and being involved. We're so grateful for, for your involvement and your enthusiasm. Um, obviously, today's stream is completely free, but if uh, any of our viewers would like to make a donation to support our work, uh, we would be extremely grateful. Um, as many of you know, case in Afghanistan uh, of COVID-19 um, are really taking its grip. Um, our staff are working on the front line to try and help people through the crisis, um, installing hand washing facilities and providing families with protective equipment and uh, emergency relief such as food packages and hygiene kits. Um, so if you'd like to make a voluntary donation, uh, you can head to our website or you can text the resu to um, 70085 uh, to donate five pounds. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And uh, I hope you have a lovely evening. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you. 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 Thank you.